the second lecture in a sequence of lectures about the hidden Markov model. In this sequence of lectures, we're progressing from talking about the idea of a Markov model, an observable Markov model, and progressing into the idea of a hidden Markov model and the different questions that are typically asked about that. In the previous lecture, we talked about the Markov property, and we talked about how it relates to basic machine learning classification. In this lecture, what I want to do is walk through an abstract example of the Markov property operating to introduce some of the formalisms that we'll be developing over the course of the remaining lectures. So if we consider an example of a discrete Markov model, so a Markov model is discrete if it has distinct states that the, that the model can be in at a given moment. We can look at this example here and recognize that there are five different states that are present. S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. And as a side note, this sequence of lectures is drawn from a paper by Rabiner called a Tutorial on Hidden Markup Models and Selected Applications in Speech Recognition. It's a great, although dense, article that introduces the basics of hidden markup models, among other things. So in this markup model, not hidden, but discrete observable, we have five states that we can be in. And this diagram over on the left visually demonstrates the transition probabilities between the different states. We know that generally speaking, if we have five states in a markup model, there must be a total of 25 transition probabilities that we have to define. Because for every state that we can be in, one through five, we have a chance of transitioning to any of the five states, one through five, including the possibility of staying in a particular state as well. So when we look at a diagram like this, this diagram is a visual representation of a five by five matrix of probabilities. And the way that they relate is we look at that diagram and we say that there are arrows only on those entries that are non-zero. So this diagram assumes that all zero probability transitions are just not shown. And because there's no other information on this graph, we also assume that transition probabilities are equal if one is shown. So for example, take the case of S2. In S2, there are two arrows that lead out of S2. One goes to S1, and the other one loops back around and goes back to S2. And so what we can say is we can say that the transition probability of moving from S2 to S2 is 50%. The probability of moving from S2 to S1 is 50%. And the probability of moving from S2 to S3, S4, or S5 is 0%. Otherwise, there would be a line on this diagram. Similarly, if we look at the probabilities for um, state S4, from S4, we have three options. We can go to S1, we can go to S5, or we can go to S4, stay in the same state. We cannot go to S2 or to S3. There's no arrow out of S4 going to those states. So we know that the transition probability from 4 to 2 and 4 to, 4 to 3 is 0. Since there's no other information on this diagram, we assume that there's a one-third probability, 33.3% chance, of moving from S1, moving to S1, to S5, or staying in position S4. So that's the way you read a diagram like this. This diagram is an alternative way of representing a matrix of transition probabilities. All right, now one of the assumptions about the Markov model is that there is a transition on regular beats. And those beats can either be temporal, or they can be structural, or they can be something about your system that dictates a change in states. So if we think about the example we looked at previously of the ladders in a DNA strand, the changes happen on discrete rungs of that DNA double helix. And so the transition state is dictated by the shape of the molecule. But we could also think about things changing like a metronome. Every minute, maybe, we see a transition. Maybe every hour we see a transition. But whatever it is, there's an expectation that there's a regular and equal duration or space or representation of what is happening between each one of those beats. So let's walk through this as an example on this particular state. Let's imagine that we're going to start in state S3. And then on a given beat, we're going to make a transition. Now we know we're not going to transition on any of the zero probability transitions, but all the other ones in this model are equally likely. A transition is going to be made, so if we observe S3, a possible next observation for this, this system that we're modeling with a Markov model is that we could be in S4. On our third beat, 
we make a transition that's possible, but probabilistically determined, to S5. On the next beat, we make a choice. Well, we don't make a choice. The system randomly decides to move to S4. The next beat, the system randomly models a choice to S1. Now that we're in S1, we have two choices of where to go next. We can either stay in S1, or we can move to S3. And so on the final beat of this example, we end up staying in S1. This gives us an observation sequence of S3, S4, S5, S4, S1, S1, representing transitions through our model. Now what we want to do is we want to acknowledge that these happened on particular beats, and we're going to number the beats. We'll use one indexing since we're sticking in a mathematical world rather than a coding world. And we want to take those no that notation and those beats, and we want to represent them with a new variable Q, Q sub I. And in this case, Q sub 1, therefore, is equal to the first state that we were in, or S3. Q2 was S4, Q3 was S5, Q4 was S4, Q5 was S1, and Q6 was S1. So as we walk through the sequence of beats, Q1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that variable takes on the value of the state that we were in. We can say that QT is the state of the system at time t. Now if we want to fully describe what the probability is of being in state qt, sorry, if we want to fully describe what the probability is that at time qt we're in state sz, we would have to know the full sequence of observations all the way back to our first observation. Because generally speaking, what state we are in at time qt could depend on any of the previous states that we were in. So a full probabilistic description of a given system would require knowledge of the current state, qt, and all the previous states. Now, we are going to represent this as a Markov model, and as a result, we don't need that full history because the Markov property says that if we know what the previous state was, that is enough to determine what the probability of the next state is. So the probability that at time qt we're in state sz depends only and entirely on the state of the system at qt minus 1. So we can say what the probability is of being in state sj given that we were at si by looking at how, what our model parameters are. If we assume that our, and one assumption we're making in this is that our transition probabilities aren't changing that this is a steady state system, and that regardless of where we are in that temporal period of beats, our transition probabilities are the same. There are other formalisms that don't make this assumption that allow the transition probabilities to change over time, but in this example, we're keeping them constant. We're going to introduce a notation, AIJ, that describes what the probability is of being in state SJ given that we were just at, S at SI. So, prob so AIJ represents the probability of moving from state I to state G under the assumption that I and J are indexes that describe which of the N states we are currently in. It's important to keep track of the um, ordering of these um, letters going from I to J and then AIJ. In fact, I had to film this lecture twice because I got it wrong the first time. All right, couple constraints. We know that any transition probability has got to be greater than or equal to zero. Zero means we're not going to make that transition ever. But we don't really have an understanding for what a negative probability transition is. And so that transition AIJ has got to be greater than or equal to zero. Furthermore, we also know that it has to be less than or equal to one because we don't have an understanding of what a probability greater than 100% is. And also we know that the sum of all possible destinations that, that we know that if we are in state i, we must move to some state j. And so the probability of the, all of the possible transitions from state i to state j must sum up to 1. And we can represent that with, that, with the equation there on the bottom. The sum, from the, the sum over j from i to n of a i j equals 1. If we think back to our example of the DNA strand, using the Markov property, we can say that, oh, well, AIJ represents the transitions from T to A, T to C, T to T, and T to G, T to G, where I, in this case, is the state T, in this system we have four states, 
and j, if we set j equal to a, well then a i j equals the probability of moving from t to a is 10%. And the probability of moving from t to c is 15%. And t to t is 25%, and t to g is 50%. So using that equation at the top, we can say the probability that at time qt we're in state g, given that at qt minus 1 we were in state t, is 50%. If you look at those probabilities, you can see that yes, in fact, they're all greater than or equal to zero, and the sum of all probabilities leaving state t adds up to one, because you must make some transition, and so they have to add up to one. All right, so this is called an observable Markov model, and I draw that out to contrast it from the hidden Markov model, which is where we're moving towards. This means that we can observe the result of the world, whatever world we're modeling, which is creating each state, si, at time i. We can, we can observe that, we can see that, we can verify it, we can train on it. Each state corresponds to an observable event, something that we can directly see and know. Different than a hidden Markov model, but for the observable Markov model, this is how we operate. All right, next what I would like to do is I'd like to work, I would like to do some work in manipulating those equations and answering some questions based on this formalism that we've introduced, eventually working towards the formalism of the hidden Markov model. Thank you for your attention.